Hello and welcome to Amanda's Wellbeing Podcast, a podcast where we discuss all things relating to your well-being, including interviews with experts in the fields of nutrition, physical and mental health, and my five-minute food facts series. I'm Amanda Hayes, your host, a nutritionist with a passion for well-being. Before I introduce today's guests, I will take a moment to let you know that you can subscribe to my podcast on YouTube, hit the red subscribe button, or on your favorite podcast app, iTunes, Stitcher, Spreaker, Spotify, or Google Podcasts. I will also mention that although I will often be speaking with experts, any information or advice provided in Amanda's Wellbeing Podcast is not intended to be used to treat, cure, or prevent injuries or medical conditions, and is not a substitute for advice from your own health professionals. Today, I am here with Dr. Tim Crow. I first came across Tim when I started my postgraduate study at Deakin University. He taught me principles of nutrition, one of the foundation subjects, and then sports nutrition. I was so impressed by Tim's encyclopedic knowledge of all things nutrition. Tim has been working in the field of nutrition for over 25 years. He's recently left the world of academia behind and is a freelance health and medical writer and scientific consultant. Tim has a blog and a website called Thinking Nutrition, which is full of really relevant and interesting and credible information. And he's recently launched a podcast also called Thinking Nutrition, which is really worth listening to. And I will put links to all of those things in the show notes. So it is my absolute pleasure to be chatting with Dr. Tim Crow today. Uh, Tim, welcome to Amanda's Wellbeing Podcast. Great. Thank you for having me on. It's, it's great to connect with you again after some years of studying at Deacon, Amanda. Yeah, look, it's my my pleasure. So Tim, nutrition has been described as a young science and you've been working in the field for over 25 years. So I think I'm correct in saying that studying nutritional dietetics is a popular choice today, but 25 years ago, I suspect it wasn't on people's radar as much it is, as it is now. So how did your interest in nutrition develop? Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, you're very right. Today, we are more interested in health and nutrition than we have been at any other time in, in history. And, and my interest in nutrition developed um, over some years of actually working in medical research. Initially, mm-hmm. I, I worked in cancer research and then moved into diabetes. And it was that exposure of appreciating the lifestyle factors such as you know, diet and obesity as, as um, uh, propagating the disease that really got me interested in the nutrition side of it. And from a personal level, I just started getting back into running back then um, into marathon running. So I had a lot of interest in the role of sports nutrition in improving performance. Yeah. So I found myself coming up to work every day where I was, had a lab coat on and safety glasses and working in, with, with cells, finding myself reading more and more papers about nutrition that had no relevance to the work I was doing mm-hmm. that just fascinated me. And it got to the stage where I realized that this is probably where my interest is lying in the future. Yeah. So I yeah. started exploring career options and the word nutrition and dietetics kept com- popping up. So I bit the bullet and went and retrained as a, a dietitian, and then the career took off from there as far, as far as following the nutrition pathway, but with the base of medical research. Yeah, well, that's great because it meant you could understand and interpret um, research papers with a degree of that's exactly accuracy. Right, and, which is, yeah. We fast forward today and a lot of the stuff I do is science communication, so it was mm. great having that solid foundation in yes. biochemistry and molecular biology and, and, and research. Um, translating that to the nutrition world. And you also did a PhD. Was that part of your dietetics study or was that a previous to that? That's right. So the PhD was before dietetics, but right. it, it doesn't really matter what you do the topic in. It's, yeah. it's just the, the training and research, methodology, mm. r- critical evaluation. So that was before nutrition and dietetics, but it made no difference. It was just yeah. as transferable across. Yep. What was the topics? I love the names of some of the PhDs. Oh, God. Yeah, the... Uh, Thyroid hormone regulation of a human cancer cell line. That's what oh, it was. Okay. <laughs> it was, it was very, it sounds like like very it's... basic research. Yeah. Oh, that sounds interesting. And so then you, you studied dietetics and you ended up teaching at Deakin, which is where I came across Tim. So right. how did that um, happen for you? Uh, so I, as a graduate, as a dietitian, I was very keen to get out in the clinical world. So I worked in, uh, in hospitals for about a year in oncology mostly, which I really loved. But not surprisingly, coming from my research background mm-hmm. and always having an interest in teaching, 
that wasn't quite enough for me. So the, the lure of academia was, was quite strong and the position came up at Deakin back in 2001. And uh, I was there for 16 years as, a, as an wow. academic, going from a lecturer up to an associate professor. So it was a wonderful, wonderful oh, career fantastic. to actually work and research and communicate in nutrition all the time and, and meet lots, you know, lots of wonderful students over the years, such as myself. <laughs> Thank you, Tim. So obviously you had a good time there if you were there for 16 years, but now you've, you've made a bit of a change and you've left the world of academia behind and you're a freelance health and medical writer and scientific consultant. You also have a blog and a website called Thinking Nutrition and you've recently launched the Thinking Nutrition podcast. So congratulations on that. Thank you. I'm, I'm, jo I'm joining the cool kids such as you and the Wobble Oh, podcast. yes. So what, why, why did you leave the world of um, academia and, and take the leap into the world of freelance? Yeah, that's probably for my last 10 years at Deakin, which is quite a lot. I was getting more involved in, in, in media work. Mm -hmm. in, in writing and just developing my own social media presence. It started off very small, but I just came up with this name of Thinking Nutrition and I got active on Twitter and, and Facebook and a blog. And that just grew and grew over time. And I realized I much more enjoyed the translation and the communication side of nutrition to the world more than my, my core duties. So I kept waiting for this job to appear out of, out of nowhere that would be on Seek and would say, you know, nutrition scientist <laughs> experience in in social media and media communication and be able to do all these wonderful things such as consulting, but that job never appeared. And, and literally within a, a moment disappeared out of nowhere, I realized that I needed to create my own job. Yeah. Um, and that was the shift that, it, that, that changed. Once I saw that there wasn't going to be an employer I work for, I have to work for myself. Then very quickly I thought, okay, that's the next path for me. So it's a little bit scary yeah. going out, but it's been I wonderful. Bet. I've been doing that for, for three years now. So I, oh, fantastic. Yeah. You know, I get to do a lot of the stuff I like doing and obviously align with, you know, you still need a, an income. So you have clients you work for, but you align with the sorts of things that you want to do and they're mm. interested in it as well. So a lot of it's just communication side of nutrition, be it yeah. conference presentations for health professionals, be it writing content for websites, magazines, and also doing my own, my own thing, which is still active on social media and, and podcasting, which is great. So it sort of pays my way as my hobby, which is just doing communication all the time. Oh, that's fantastic. Well done, Tim. And one of the things that you talk about a lot, and indeed it was the subject of your first podcast, is confusion in nutrition. And I think that is a really interesting and relevant topic for a lot of people. So just as a personal example, I was drawn to studying nutrition because I was really interested in health. And so I started reading prolifically uh, anything I could get my hands on about nutrition. And I just ended up totally confused. One minute I thought coconut oil was a miracle. The next minute I thought I should eat for my blood type. And I thought, okay, I'm, I'm not making any headway here. I need to go and study this formally. So thanks to Tim, I'm now a bit more discerning about the nutrition information I consume. But I think if you haven't had that background, it is very confusing. And there are several reasons for that. And one of them is that um, new research comes out all the time. As I said earlier, nutrition is a young science. So let's chat about that a bit. Um, can you give us an example, Tim, perhaps of something that's changed since you've been working in the field of nutrition? Oh, there's dozens of examples that come yeah, to mind. I and bet. one of the things I love about nutrition is that it does change. And, you know, for good people actually acknowledge the change and change the mm. message. It's not what we're trying to confuse people. All science changes. And, and that's yeah. a good thing. Uh, a really basic example, cholesterol and eggs. You know, probably yeah. 30, 40 years ago, you need to avoid uh, eggs if you had high cholesterol and risk of heart disease. Now we know that with a few exceptions, cholesterol from eggs and animal foods has very little impact upon blood cholesterol. It's, it's saturated fat. But I can also touch upon management of IBS. We now have uh, some good evidence now for low FODMAP diets rather yeah. than just general exclusion of you know, spicy foods and other things. That's been a big change. Not that it was a strong push in nutrition to, for supplementation, but there was in the 90s, it was all about antioxidant supplements being the big propensity pre factor in cancer, heart disease, diabetes, and so on. Those trials were complete and utter failure, and it's, they showed the mm. complete reverse of what you thought the benefit would be. So it came back to the food approach. But on the surface, there was a case for doing these sorts of big studies to see if you could prevent major chronic disease with antioxidant supplements, and they were complete failure, and they actually increased the risk of yeah. some diseases. Yeah. Which is fascinating, isn't it? As you said, 
science is an evolving field, but I think the difference is there may be a, um, advances in, say, cancer research, but the thing about nutrition is that everybody eats. So it's yes. part of everybody's life. So yes. most people, whether they're interested in the facts and behind nutrition, they still eat. So I think it's really important that the message getting out to the public is clear. And I wondered if you could help us a bit discern how to find information that is credible because there is a lot of loud voices out there and some of them are coming from people who may or may not have the right qualifications and it can be confusing. You've got vegans on one side, you've got um, keto carnivore people on the other mm -hmm. and yeah. how do you know? How does the average Joe know any know what to believe? Well, you hit the nail on the head that nutrition is one of the few areas that anyone can be considered an expert simply because they eat. We don't have people yeah. out there talking about quantum physics who haven't studied physics or people yeah. talking about how to build bridges who haven't studied engineering. You know, that's a fine with that. You leave the experts to do their bit. But in nutrition, you can be pushing yourself as a hardcore expert because just because you follow a particular diet and got some results and you get a mm. lot of traction in social media. Uh, Nutrition is confusing. There, there is no clear cut answers for all the big questions in nutrition. So that once you've got that doubt, that opens up the gates for other people to come in and push, put their, their views and their stories forward. How do you get good, credible information? Our peak health bodies, uh, we have dietary guidelines, we have organizations such as Diabetes Australia, Cancer Council, Heart Foundation. They, are, they do good work. The sort of work they put out is conservative. Uh, it acknowledges where the current evidence is at and their advice does change over time. But if you're getting mm. it from those sorts of organizations or if you're reading it from a website for someone else and it's mirroring that sort of advice, you can be fairly certain this person is coming from a credible background. I mean, your qualifications are important, but there can be crazy people with qualifications as well. They're just because oh, they've yeah. got a and they can be pushing a, a more extreme view. But if it's being repeated consistently by sensible voices who are qualified in the field and it just aligns with, I guess, the common basics sense. of nutrition. Com common sense. But what is common sense? Common sense is that inherently fruits, vegetables, and mostly plant-based foods are the cornerstone of healthy diets the world over. Where it gets pushed to the extreme, say so you have to go vegan, well, that's not quite the case. If it gets pushed to the extreme, you can have all of those, those, those vegetables except grains, that's more extreme. If it's really mm. aligning to that basic sensible center, and that's probably pretty much most of what you need to know about good nutrition for just general health. It's lining with those. And they're the sort of message you see repeated consistently by credible, sensible voices. Um, one, one website is a, that I generally recommend to many people. It's called examine.com. I have no affiliation or link with them. But examine.com have a whole stable of PhD level researchers behind them who do just this. They look at all the, the research. They put forward it. Uh, a summary of various areas of, of um, nutrition and health, look at the current research, and they completely unbiased the way they do it. It's one of the best resources on the internet is examine.com because okay. it's not just one voice, it's dozens of voices involved in it. They have some services they provide, such as subscription newsletters and so on, but the core information they give is completely unaffected by industry and advertising, and it's one of the best sources to get accessible, credible evidence-based information on the internet. Oh, so I generally very recommend people go there. Yeah. I'll put a link to that. It's one that I actually notes. use. It's yep, examine.com and very easy to find. Oh, that sounds really good. And Tim, I just wanted to jump back a bit to things changing in nutrition. You co-authored a book, Understanding Nutrition, which is now in its fourth edition, I believe. Correct. That's I right. have yeah. the first one. With and the peas on cover. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, it was my textbook. I still refer back to it from time to time. But since that came out, has anything, I mean, obviously it's changed because it's in its fourth edition, but have any chapters been added on things? For example, is there anything about gut health in the current one? <laughs> That's it. Uh, edition, nutrition does not change that much. There are not seismic shifts in three no. years, you know, despite what the keto and the carnivore brigade will have you believe, you know, everything you've been told about nutrition is wrong. How food is digested, the benefits of plant-based diets, uh, 
chronic disease rates, they haven't changed a lot over that time. What has changed in the textbook is incorporating new research. And the one area that we have put more in is the gut microbiome. That's yeah. been that's been a big shift as far as acknowledging the role that plays in our health. But most of the other areas in nutrition have not changed a lot. Probably a little bit more recognition of a low carbohydrate diet for management of diseases, particularly type 2 diabetes. Um, but overall, there has not been seismic shifts. Mm. If I the textbooks point... are fairly up to date. Yeah. Oh, that's good. So I can still look at the first edition. <laughs> the first edition is just, that's just as fine as the fourth edition. Oh, good. Yeah, the thing that I've really noticed since, since I've um, stopped studying at Deakin has been the, the gut health microbiome. And there's a lot more um, media and information about that. Tim, while we are talking about current areas of interest in nutrition, I note that the ketogenic diet is very popular at the moment. In certain circumstances, I believe there is some evidence that supports it. For example, children yes. with epilepsy whose seizures yes. have not responded to, to other medications, um, potentially for improving glycemic control in patients with type 2 diabetes. Yes. Um, what about someone who doesn't have these medical conditions? What, what would you say to them about adopting a diet like the ketogenic diet? Yeah, so apart from a couple of cases where there might be a, a more of a benefit, overall, a ketogenic diet or a keto diet is a rebranding of a low-carbohydrate diet, which is a rebranding of the Atkins diet, which is a rebranding of protein power, which is rebranding of a whole bunch of other low-carbohydrate diets that have come and gone. And that probably tells you that longer term, people don't stick to a ketogenic diet that long. Um, they start introducing back their regular foods. Where it can be a benefit is that for weight loss, it doesn't seem to be a superior option. But again, if it works for someone mm. short term, then you can give it a try. But all of the health benefits attributed to it are really based upon anecdotes. Because if you lose weight, you get some benefits from that. Yeah, even of some course. Improvements in lipids and um, cholesterol and so on, although it's a bit different to a, a, a diet that is not as high in saturated fat. Uh, but people don't stick to that diet to the letter of the law. Otherwise, we'd not be having the reinvention and the rebranding and the renaming of the diet again and again and again. And that's what we're seeing at the moment. It's just, yeah. just a, a change. It's a different way to eat. Where I see most people get benefit from it is they're generally eating a pretty crap Western diet to start with. Yeah. It gives them a focus on eating healthier because no matter what dietary fat is out there, I guarantee you they do not promote high sugar, highly processed foods. Totally agree. It's, it's probably... And that, all those things get thrown out. That's the difference. Yeah, it's a, it's a lot about what you're not eating. <laughs> You know, exactly. the fact that you're it's not eating, more. you know, some processed junk and you're eating more a whole food-based diet, I think, rather than the fact that your macros are 70% fat and 20% yes. protein or whatever it is. It's, yeah, it's, all, so. it's all pretty much irrelevant. If there is a difference, it's very hard to pick up in clinical trials, you know, to say maybe this person does do better on a low-carbohydrate diet compared to this person that does better on a high-carb diet. It's hard to predict that, but, but overall it's that, it's the focus on healthy eating is where the benefit lies. And knowing that in six months' time, there are very few people who are drew ketogenic, who are still in ketosis. Right. They start making some changes. And we know that because diet studies have studied this again and again and again. Yeah. No matter what diet you choose, it, that's irrelevant. The compliance starts to fall over time, which is why yeah. we need to have new diets coming in. And now keto has morphed into carnival because you need to have yes. it more extreme. You need a new gimmick, a new branding. So I don't fight against them. I try and look at the positives and get back to a sensible center, which is mostly if it's, if it's you know, generally mostly plant-based foods and you can maybe yeah. throw out the non-starchy, the starchy ones if you're on a low-carb diet. That's where some of the biggest health benefits lie is from, from those foods. Unless you're carnivore, then you've just forgotten about all of that stuff or just choose to ignore it, blocking your fingers in the ear and you think that no, none of those plant foods have any benefit for my health at all. It's to be conspiracy by big plant. I'm just going to keep going carnivore. <laughs> and that's the issue I have with that diet. But I think if you're believing that sort of cool aid, you probably believe a lot of other rubbish you read on the internet about, about that diet. Yeah, it's, um, it's a fraught area, I think, isn't it? So... Um... I think the other thing that comes into play with all of that is confirmation bias, because if you're constantly searching up things on the internet, like, I don't know, say you're searching up carnivore diet, it's just going to keep throwing that kind of information at you. Absolutely. Um, and, and you'll read lots of information. You'll see guys there with great six packs and all the weight they've lost. I mean, mm. there was a Joe Rogan post he put on uh, 
Instagram went viral from the weight he lost on a, on a carnivore diet. Now, when you look at it, it actually wasn't anything to do with a carnivore diet. He lost a lot of weight. His energy levels um, increased. I can find people that went on an all McDonald's diet for a month and lost weight and felt great because they just had a calorie and portion control. Yeah. So, and even he admitted that after one month, he wasn't going to keep following it. So mm. if you get results, if you feel better for it, fantastic, well done. But it's not a not some magical hack that you've suddenly discovered. There's been loads of people out there playing with all sorts of games with these different types of diets, judge, adjusting macros, banning this food, including more, including more of this food, and they can get similar results if they adhere to it. Because the biggest predictor long term of the success on any diet is sticking to the diet you chose, not the diet per se. Per se, yeah. I think really a lot of it's got to do with habit change. And that's hard. And that's why yes. diets ultimately fail. Yes. Yeah. So it's a lot of a, I think there's a lot of psychology involved in it in terms of, you know, working out how you can change your habits and, you know, preferences to change your preference from eating sort of an unhealthy to a healthy diet, really. Mm -hmm. Absolutely right. And that's where... Uh, losing the weight because that's really what the focus of these diets uh, is apart from people trying to manage disease such as type 2 diabetes losing the weight is actually incredibly easy no matter what diet you pick it's actually mm -hmm. sticking to that longer term and that's where yeah. the longer term behavioral modification comes in yeah uh, and one of the big predictors of that is ongoing help advice and support so i really don't care about debating this diet versus that diet it's you know is this a sustainable option for you and if it is yeah. and you're generally eating healthier for it well that's great yeah. you're in a better place you're in a better place from where you were. So there you go. You've heard it here. <laughs> uh, so, Tim, just to, about you then. If you're someone who um, takes a sensible approach to diet, um, you, you avoid fads. So can you walk us through what does a day in the dietary life of Dr. Tim Crow look like? So what, what would be a typical day for you? Oh, it's pretty boring. There's no superfoods every food i eat oh. i eat because i like the taste of it rather than because i read something about the internet as being bad <laughs> it's a, a lot of a lot of nuts and dried fruit because i'm a runner yeah. so they're, they're yeah. great they're great snack food i mean nuts dried fruit and muesli bars are my staple snack just to keep fueling going all day long uh, it involves plenty plenty of coffee yes it involves same. tea uh, it involves carbohydrates bread rice pasta vegetables i eat meat i consume dairy products because i like them and yeah. the evidence in the end just says you know that they're fine to include the only real change i've made in my diet over many years so i don't eat as much red meat as i used to i think that's one area that does stand out evidence wise is that's one thing that's worth limiting um yeah. apart from all the processed crappy foods that's it that's a given but yeah. as far as what we consider staple foods probably eating less red meat you would be better for it but outside of that I try and include more legumes in my diet. That's one thing that I've seen lots of evidence for um, them having a, a superior benefit to probably any other food you could probably yeah, eat. And they're delicious. Legumes, mm. And they're delicious. So I try and yeah. have some lentils, even baked beans. That, that counts as having a legume. A can of baked beans is, is having legumes. So yeah. there's easier ways to get into your diet without thinking you're going all, all hippie veggio. Um, doing well, my that. son so, loves that. Uh, he loves a tin of baked beans. <laughs> That's his uh, midnight snack. <laughs> Um, dinner, dinner on toast. Yeah, yeah so there's exactly. No, there's nothing, nothing special in there. I eat uh, fruit, blueberries. I love. So yeah, I have same. A lot of those. So I eat foods that I like that overall I know are, are going to be fairly healthy as well. So yeah. And Tim, you mentioned that you're a runner, so I can't sit here and virtually in your presence and not talk about running. So Tim is a sub three hour marathoner. So that's that's pretty amazing. So what's what's your favourite race distance, Tim? Well, it was the marathon, but I, I, I retired two years ago. It was just getting yeah, the, the training, the obsession, that the yeah. smashing my body up over 15 years. I've just gone, no, that's it. I'm, I'm done. And, and in fact, the reason why I stopped was I realized my PBs are behind me. So the motivation to get up and train <laughs> wasn't there anymore. And that's okay. why that, that motivated me. It was, it was getting yeah. you know, better times every year. Now I'm just a 10K runner. Just a, you know, I'll go out for a run every morning, generally 10Ks. Um, do 70, 80 Ks a week. And that's just nice. for health and fitness. Yeah, and that's a, that's a nice mix, you know, a nice medium place to be in. So now I don't, I don't race. I don't compete. I just, I just run, enjoy running just for, around the park. for enjoyment. Yeah. yeah. Just do you for run, enjoyment. Well, I, yeah. Do you run with friends or just by yourself or? No, normally it's just by, just by me. Yeah. yeah. It's Cause it's convenient. What I like yeah. about running 
um, you don't have to run. You can do any exercise that works for you. But I like just getting up in the morning, putting my shoes on and, and going out the door. Yeah, Maybe. I'm the same. I love running. And, and um, yeah, it's convenient. And it's. Um, I also do triathlons. And, oh, my goodness, the amount of stuff you need for that is nuts. I, Whereas running is just I, shoes, basically. I just I take my hat off to anyone that does triathlons over any distance. Just that, that change in mental shift of you not only have to run, but you have to fit in bike and swimming each week into your schedule and i, yeah. I just was you know struggled to, just to get running in as far it's as having busy, a, a program that mm, busy, busy. Life. yeah yeah and one of the other things that's been happening in the nutrition world is um technology about nutrigenomics and the way mm-hmm. food interacts with our genes uh, and there's some talk of personalised nutrition where sometime in the future we'll be able to analyse our genes and be told the you know, ideal diet for, for, for us. So what do you think about that? Where do you think that's heading, Tim? Well, you hit the nail on the head, Amanda, that it's potential for the future and we haven't quite got to the future yet. Yeah. It's very seductive, that the idea that you can get true personalised nutrition based on your genes. Mm. But from what I've seen so far, the studies that have been done when they do try and personalize, you don't see a big, you know, it doesn't make have a big impact because in the end, no matter how personalized the advice, you have to follow it. Yeah, and, of course. Yeah. And apart from a couple of clear mutations where we know that mutation X definitely has to be, you need to be restricting or having more of these foods. Overall, it's hard to get some solid science to say that this is going to be the best approach for you. And even if it is, you have to stick and follow to it. So probably the nutrigenomics has always been the next be- big thing, but we're not there yet. Mm. I've seen some really interesting prelim stuff to do with the your microbiome rather than your 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 genes, your microbiome yep. genome. My, microbiome is genome. Uh, using that to predict what may be the best sort of diet to follow. And there's already been some really interesting work showing that your glycemic responses to food after a meal, we know it's incredibly variable. Your response to an apple is different to mine. One of the predictors of that difference between us is actually our gut microbes. So this really opens up potential for true personalization at a food level by knowing what someone's gut microbiome fingerprint is. So we're in very early days. There's only one company I know in Australia that actually offers that service of getting some individualization of dietary advice based upon your um, gut microbiome but i see more potential in that in the future than not more so than our genes because i haven't seen a big involvement in in genomic um, prediction of disease as far as modifying your diet with that well that i mean that's really interesting i guess it's a space to watch isn't it Um, absolutely it's one that i watch with a lot of interest yeah yeah so tim thank you very much and I like to ask all my guests the same question at the end of my podcast. If you could recommend two things that all people could do to improve their well-being, what would they be? They can be anything. They don't have to be nutrition related. Oh, okay. There'd be two things. Well, the first one will be that walk into a, a supermarket or a, a, a green grocer and everything you see in front of you, the fruit and veg section, is awesome to have. They're all superfoods. Um, just pick on pick them on purely based on pond color. That's all you need to focus on. Use color. If you're seeing more colors in your diet over the course of your day, you're probably going to be healthy. So long as, of course, it's coming from you know fresh natural foods. Yes. Then you can then you can ignore everything else you read on in the on social media and that you hear in the media because Simple, you're getting eighty hey? percent right. That's that's pretty much that. I would say most of a nutrition degree is fruit and vegetable section, and then if you choose to some some legumes or grains added to it. That's the core of a diet. If you want to have dairy, if you want to have meat, that's your choice. But if you've got that right, that's most of health covered and you can ignore all the debates about keto versus vegan and so you on. You can save yourself uh, this, a lot of time. <laughs> absolutely. That's, that's all you need to know. That's based upon 30 years, me working in the field. you have yet to see anything dispute that that's the core of a healthy dietary pattern. We can make things more complex because we have chronic disease and people don't Mm. follow that sort of advice. So that's the one. And the second is the importance of of exercise. If you put exercise in a pill, it would be the biggest selling pharmaceutical drug of all time. Uh, It's benefits, I would say far outweigh even diet to an extent, just it's impact upon our mental health, uh, our physical health, disease prevention. And it's only one thing. And the nice thing about exercise, we don't generally have the debates in exercise. We still have in nutrition. That's true. It's, 
No one Maybe says a little it's bit bad about, for you. you. Know, is it going to be exactly? It's not you know unless you go a bit obsessed, become an obsessive yeah. marathon runner, you're probably going to be okay. And whether it's swimming versus running versus walking, all caps on the grid, it's all going to be good for you. So the biggest benefits you could get from one activity without all the controversy is going to be exercise. And yeah. I always get asked, what's the best form of exercise, and when's the best time to do it? My answer is always, do exercise that you like doing. And do it when you can do it. And that's all you need to know. Yeah, I think that's right. If you, if you pick something you like, you're more likely to keep doing it and persist with it, aren't you? And Tim, could you let uh, our listeners know where they can follow you? Okay, so my, my website, thinkingnutrition.com.au, you, I have a, my blog there. I'm very active on uh, Facebook uh, as Thinking Nutrition uh, and also podcasts, which I'm very active yes. on now. So Thinking Nutrition is where you'll find it. Just search for that in your pods and you'll come across me and the sorts of content I'm producing as well. Great. Thank you very much, Tim. Thank you, Amanda. And that was Dr. Tim Crow. Tim is so knowledgeable. He's like a human nutrition encyclopedia. I encourage you to subscribe to his podcast, Thinking Nutrition. It's informative, interesting and topical. You'll find links to that and all we've mentioned in the podcast in the show notes. You can subscribe to Amanda's Wellbeing Podcast on YouTube, hit the subscribe button, and while you're there, click on the bell to be alerted when new episodes are available. You can also subscribe on your favourite podcast app, iTunes, Stitcher, Spreaker, Spotify or Google Podcasts. And you can follow the podcast on Twitter, Instagram and Facebook. Direct links to all social media can be found on the subscribe page of my website at www.amandaswellbeingpodcast.com. If you would like to contact me, you can leave me a message via the contacts page on my website. And please feel free to suggest topics you'd like to learn more about and people you'd like to hear interviewed. And I'll do my best to deliver that to you. Producing the podcast is a labour of love. We put in a lot of time, money and effort behind the scenes. So if you enjoy Amanda's Wellbeing Podcast and would like to make a contribution via Patreon, PayPal or by Amazon to help ensure we provide you with excellent content, please visit the Contribute page on my website. Finally, please take a minute to leave a rating on iTunes. It improves visibility of the podcast and will help me source excellent guests. Thank you for tuning in. Eat well, move well, think well.